He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and its chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, Pilate asked. After Pilate said this, he returned to the Jewish leaders and said, I find no grounds for any charge against him. Now you have a custom that I release one prisoner for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted, not this man. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas was an outlaw. Then Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Over and over they went up to him saying, Greetings, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came out of the palace again and said to the Jewish leaders, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no grounds for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. When the chief priests and their deputies saw him, they shouted out, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, you take him and crucify him. I don't find any grounds for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders replied, we have a law, and according to this law, he ought to die, because he made himself out to be God's son. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the residence and spoke to Jesus. Where are you from? Jesus didn't answer. So Pilate said, you won't speak to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and also to crucify you? Jesus replied, You would have no authority over me if it had not been already given to you from above. That's why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From that moment on, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. However, the Jewish leaders cried out, saying, If you release this man, you aren't a friend of the emperor. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was about noon on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, here's your king. They cried out, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate responded, what, do you want me to crucify your king? We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's too late. The soldiers have already come and Jesus is already in custody. The 
friends have betrayed, denied, fled, given up. And what's more, now Jesus has been put in the hands of perhaps the most dangerous man in his country, into the hands of Pilate, the Roman governor, who makes a mockery of the sacred holiday that's just about to begin, a holiday meant to celebrate whole new freedom, freedom from Egypt, freedom from slavery, freedom from oppressors, freedom to love God, serve God, and to live in a whole new way. Pilate has only a paltry and symbolic freedom to offer. You can have this one, or you can have that one, but you can't have both, and you can't have it all. Because while Pilate may not be skilled in debating Jesus on matters either spiritual or earthly, the idea that he is a king is too big a threat. The idea that Pilate will lose his job and be replaced for having failed to pacify the land he was sent to control is real. The danger that he will lose his bargain working together with the Sadducees and the chief priests, the leaders of the temple party, these risks are too real and too much. It's too late. Here the very one who breathed life into the world and who was the motivation for all of creation finds himself in the hands of one who can mock, who can order his torture, can order his death. Jesus speaks of a kingdom and a reality that is beyond this world, and yet very much intertwined with it. A reality where God's will is done, and God's love is expressed to the utmost. A love for the world that would mean any price could be paid in order to rescue and reconcile it. As we bear witness to Jesus' trial at this hour, as we watch the soldiers mock and abuse him. We see in his peaceful response the very love of God taking shape in human form. Friends, this was for you and for me. And if we're honest, was by you and by me as well. The love that Christ offered each of us, we turned away, we turned away. Let us not turn away now. Let us not turn away from bearing witness both to what Christ has suffered but also to what he has done for you, for me. Here is the man. Here is the one on whom God poured all the power of the Holy Spirit. Here is the son that gives God delight. Here is the one who came not to judge and destroy the world, but to save it. Throughout this day, let us watch, let us bear witness, let us not put Jesus on trial in our hearts too. 
it's so easy to look upon him, to marvel at the pain, the loss, the suffering, and to want to look away. But friends, this is for you. So let us bear witness throughout this day to what God has done. And give thanks that when we tried to strike God down, God did not return that, but rather returned forgiveness, mercy, and a path to new life. For this, we give thanks to God. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, for by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, in the morning, Jesus was betrayed into the hands of sinners. Sinners like us. He brought God's love and they returned scorn. He showed God's truth and they threw lies at him. He showed us mercy. Let us cling to that mercy now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
19 verses 16b to 24. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on a cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without a seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. This reading from the Gospel of John basically describes the crucifixion of Jesus, um, but not the death of Jesus. So what did Jesus do for us through his crucifixion? Where do I begin? He fulfilled the prophecy of his death. He was betrayed, scorned, mocked, humiliated, rejected, beaten. He experienced excruciating pain. All of this was done to an innocent man. In Psalm 22, David cries out to God to save him from the torment of his enemies. And he uses the descriptions of someone being executed, although David himself was not. These descriptions symbolized his anguish in feeling that he had been abandoned by God. There are many pieces of Psalm 22 that parallel the crucifixion of Jesus. However, the Old Testament scripture, it's, it's fulfilled even more and more literally in Jesus' experience. Psalm 22 begins with the agonizing cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And although many think that the, G, these words came directly from Jesus, he was quoting these words from the psalm as he suffered on the cross. His suffering was unique because he offered himself up for the sins of his people. He also bore on the cross our agony and suffering. He was stripped nearly naked for the cross, and Roman law granted the soldiers the right to the clothes that a convicted person was wearing. The four soldiers div divided among themselves four pieces of Jesus' clothing, and when they gambled to see who, when they gambled to see who would get Jesus' undergarment, all at the foot of the cross, they left him quite literally with no possessions. 
as 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 states, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption through his complex, dark, and mysterious death. He chose to stand in the place of guilty sinners. He knew that God had sent him into the world for one reason, to become the complete and final sacrifice for our sins. Jesus never sinned and made the immeasurable sacrifice to become sin and receive God's wrath upon sin and sinners. He did this because of his and God's great love for us. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 5 states, But because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Embracing Christ means believing in our hearts, letting him into our hearts, declaring that he is the Lord. It is through his resurrection that we inherit everlasting life. And you'll learn more about his resurrection next week. We only need to accept God's grace humbly through Christ, to turn away from the wrongs that we have done and receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we will be born again, saved, whatever you've heard it called or whatever you want to call it. We can't achieve salvation on our own. And I'm going to repeat that. We can't receive salvation on our own. We can't do it by being a good person, by giving generously to the church, by helping those in need, by praying or reading the Bible. But we do all of these things and more because we are called to be like Christ. We do them because our lives are more fulfilled and gratifying when in our hearts we know that we are saved by Jesus' free gift of redemption through his sacrifice on the cross.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, I lift to you those people who are trying to do it on their own. We can't do it alone. Help us realize we don't need to earn your grace, Lord. It is a free gift from Jesus. Help us remember this as we go through our daily lives, that it's not what we do, it's why we do it, because of your love. We offer deep gratitude to Jesus Christ for his sacrifice, suffering, and death on the cross so many years ago. I lift all of this to you in the name of our precious Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus' death. I'm reading from John 19, verse 25 through 42. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. 
These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Quote, not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, quote, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea came and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. So with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited with Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let's just take a moment and let that the scripture reading sink in. God, we ask for your guidance. We ask that you be present with us as we hear these difficult stories. Help us to really bring ourselves present and help us to hear what it is you need us to hear in these words today. Amen. Even at the end of his life, Jesus was concerned about others. As he was dying, he saw his mother and three other women who had remained with him, even as he suffered on the cross. Most others had left by then, whether because it was too painful to watch him suffer or because they were afraid of drawing attention to themselves. But these women steadfastly present, these women steadfastly present, witnesses to Jesus' suffering and soon witnesses to his death. The disciple whom Jesus loved was still there too. And Jesus told them all that they would be family for one another after he was no longer there with them. Bearing witness is powerful, but incredibly difficult. It's an incredibly difficult aspect of any day in our lives, but this particular day that's described in scriptures Bearing witness must have been very, very difficult for those women and that disciple. When we choose to remain with someone who is in pain, when we choose to bear witness to their suffering, we discover others who become family to us, others who also care deeply about the pain and suffering they see and from which they are not willing to turn away. On Good Friday, we bear witness to Jesus' suffering and his death. Today, we also bear witness to our sisters and brothers who suffer in this present time. We bear witness to those who are hurt and even killed when they are treated as dispensable by the powers that be. Jesus says very little at this point in the narrative except, I'm thirsty, and accepts a bit of wine vinegar to drink. His thirst reminds us of his humanness. Jesus thirsted just as anyone would thirst under the extreme torture of crucifixion. After taking that small bitter sip, he says, it is finished, and he gives up his spirit. Jesus lets go into death. He let his spirit go in a conscious way, it's possible to be conscious at the end of one's life, but it's difficult. It means facing the truth of the moment, recognizing the imminent pain of separation from loved ones. Maybe you've been with someone in the moment of their death. It is a precious and holy moment. Precious and holy to watch a loved one's body become a shell while their spirit becomes free of the constraints of physicality. Jesus suffered greatly at the end of his life. We know this. 
it is painful for us to go through this suffering with him, even just reading these scriptures. We don't like dwelling on the ugliness and the details that are exposed in these scriptures. But I think reading or listening to this account is also hard because it forces us to look at our own complicity in the ugliness that exists in the world today. You and I weren't with Jesus when he died, but there is pain and suffering still in the world today. And today, we can choose. We can choose to bear witness to this pain and suffering, or we can turn away, pretend it doesn't exist, imagine it has nothing to do with us. A question we're asked to face is, do we have the courage, the fortitude, and the faith to bear witness? Do we have the courage, the fortitude, and the faith to bear witness? Perhaps an even deeper question is, are we willing to put our faith into action by standing in solidarity with those who suffer today? Let's pray together. Faithful God, this time in Jesus' life is painful for us to relive. We would much rather avoid reading these accounts of his awful suffering and of his death. Sometimes we don't feel like very faithful disciples. And so we, we pray, be with us, Lord, as we face our failings. Be with us as we recognize and own up to the times when we haven't borne witness to your love when we saw someone suffering. We ask for forgiveness for the times we have turned away from the pain of others. Please, Lord, show us the way forward through this lonely time of separation. We pray in the name of Jesus, to whom we bear witness as best we can, and ask that you would help us to do better. In his name we pray. Amen.